Thank you all for joining me. I have never seen this many little postage stamp box size boxes now on the Zoom screen. I'm impressed that the system can handle it. Oh, this is terrific. All right. So at this point, you should all be able to see a screen that says impact in space, science, and, and society. Um, uh, this is a keynote presentation. Um, this, uh, as I like to point out, uh, Microsoft was never used in the development of this presentation. So uh, for those of you who are Microsoft fans, my apologies. Um, now, the point here is once I go to full screen, I cannot see the participant list. So Sean, if you wouldn't mind tracking, letting me know. Uh, if someone raise a hand and allow them to uh, open up. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about a number of different things here, and I've got a few images up on top that uh, try to highlight some of the issues we can get to. Um, so ju just running through the, uh, the pictures, really from the top right and then going towards the left. Uh, so the picture on the top right is actually of the moon, uh, as I'm hoping that all of you recognize. Um, and this is the moon at just about the phase that we have tonight. So if you get a chance to go look outside uh, later after the talk, uh, once it uh, gets uh, sufficiently dark and go look at it, this is pretty much what you will see. Uh, if you look to the right end of the, of the surface of the moon here, yeah, this is a gibbous phase, right? If you look towards the right, you'll see a relatively bright crater. It's actually, these pictures are hiding it. There we go. Um, and I should be able to annotate. Let's see if I can make this work. There, you see this crater here? This is Tycho. And we're gonna talk about that uh, later in, actually in the second class, uh, in the second session, not today. But I want to point out that when you look at the moon, when you go out tonight and look at that moon, uh, this thing that you see here, which people call the man in the moon, or I like to see the rabbit in the moon, with the rabbit ears here, uh, this is really the signature of massive impacts. Uh, and these are the kinds of topics we want to talk about today. Um, you can also see off Tycho, you see these waves that go all the way across. Some of these go more than almost a halfway across here. You can see parts of it going right across. Uh, so you, you cover very large distances with an event of this type. Uh, so this picture on the left is something we're going to get to a little later. That's actually a picture from my former graduate student, Amy Degro, who I see is on the call somewhere. Uh, so this is a picture of astrocytes that she took. Um, the, the basically, uh, parts of the brain, uh, cells within the brain. We're going to talk about that uh, two classes from now. This picture is a picture, a movie actually, taken by Deb Joy Malik, who is also on the call. Um, and it show, shows you the kind of events um, uh, we are going to discuss some of that today. Uh, so we, we're thinking of, about different scales here, right? So here is the moon, a couple of thousand kilometers across. Here are cells, a few microns across. This is something you could hold in your hand. And then we'll think about the human head and uh, the brain and injury in the brain. And what connects all of these is they get subjected to extreme conditions and uh, they develop uh, shocks. And we're going to talk about those uh, as we go through. Now, uh, if you notice my title, I'm going to talk about space and science and society. Society is the place where I'm the least comfortable. Uh, but there are some really nice uh, links we can make uh, into uh, thinking about uh, social structures and really the, the, the rise and uh, collapse of civilizations. All right, with that uh, as background, let's see if my clicker will work. There we go. So what I want to talk about today is really getting some conceptual ideas in place about shocks and what they are and what, what uh, they can what, what we can understand by understanding shocks, what we can uh, do with the understanding of shocks that we're going to let develop in this course. I know I talk fast, by the way. I'm going to try to slow down. Um, it is particularly difficult to slow down when you don't see people's faces. So I'm going to have to remind myself to do that. The picture you see on the top right there, uh, on the top here, this is a picture of two aircraft and shock waves coming off the aircraft. Uh, this is a picture that is actually taken in color. It's kind of cool uh, to be able to see this in color. We can talk about how you do that later. But these lines are the shock waves. And we want to talk about things like that. Um, you'll see there are different colors in here, the dark blue and the dark red. Um, we'll come to that at some point. Uh, what I want to do in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is to really give you a very basic but very fundamental sense 
of how we should think about these extreme, uh, these signatures of, of extreme events that we call shocks. So let me start here uh, with a poem, uh, simply because I like poetry, and this is actually one of my favorites, um, and it gives you a sense of the kinds of things we're going to talk about. So this is a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, for those of you who have been to Boston, um, if you've been anywhere near uh, Cambridge uh, Mass, you remember uh, that one of the bridges that crosses the river is called the Longfellow Bridge, it's named after this guy. Um, so he was a, one of the great American poets. Uh, he was also a professor at Harvard. Uh, at the time he wrote this, another professor at Harvard was Jean-Louis Rudolph Agassi. Or oh, Agassi, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Agassiz was the guy who discovered uh, the Ice Ages. So he was tramping around Switzerland and realized that, um, yeah, and he did the same thing in the United States, and realized that you had to have uh, ice sheets that came all the way down the continents. And on his either 50th or 55th birthday, uh, Longfellow was at a dinner with Agassiz and wrote a poem for him, which you can find if you look at the collected works of Longfellow. Uh, and this is a, a verse that I really like. It says, come walk with me, nature said, into regions yet untrod, and read what is yet unread in the manuscripts of God. And that's what we're going to be trying to do here. We look at the signatures that we see in nature. Um, in this case, uh, what you're looking at there is a picture of Mars. This is from Google Mars. These are actually the craters on Mars. Red means it's high, blue means or green means it's low. Um, but if you look at nature, you look at the mountain peaks, you look at the flow of the land, what uh, Agassiz was doing with, in looking at uh, the ice ages, uh, you can see what happened in the past. So the signatures of an event are in uh, the world around us. We're going to go take a look at that and try to get a sense of why things happen and then how they happen. Okay, now the why is more important than the how. Um, so with that background, let's get into the main uh, context here. So, I'm interested in talking today primarily about the foundations of what happens when a shock arrives in a system. And I'm going to think very broadly about systems. We'd spend a lot of our time talking about shocks in solid objects or fluid objects, uh, shocks in Earth, shocks in planets, shocks in materials, uh, shocks in your brain. Uh, but I also want to extend the ideas to think about shocks in broader systems, uh, shocks in city scale systems. Uh, shocks in social structures, uh, and we'll do that towards the end of this session. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to talk about is something called a shock wave. So not a stationary shock, but a moving shock. Uh, and let's first figure out what a wave is. So he throws a rock into a pond, and there is the splash. Notice, by the way, that little jet that comes up in the middle. That's cool. That's something we're going to talk about later. Now you see the waves going out. You'll notice that that wave is propagating at some speed. You see little ripples forming from the secondary impacts. And eventually, if you're sitting on the shore, you'll see the wave arrive. And so you realize that something happened uh, in the um, pond itself. So the first thing I want to get across is the idea that waves propagate at a characteristic speed. So we have waves moving through the water here. They're moving at a fixed speed. That speed is really important to us. So we think about waves that is propagating information, and it's propagating at a certain speed. The second thing to remember is that you're using waves all the time. In fact, you're using waves right now. You're listening to me, presumably through your laptop or your computer. That has a speaker on it. That speaker is generating waves in the air. Those waves are coming to you, and your ears hear them as sound. So there's a really nice little uh, movie that was made about it. A traveling compression wave. So Schlieren visualization, along with a high-speed camera, can be used to see it as well. Here's a book landing on a table. The end of a towel being snapped. A firecracker. An AK-47. And of course, a clap. That movie was made 
using a technique called Schlieven um, photography. Uh, it's an approach that allows you to see small variations in the air. Uh, and that's why you're able to see the waves, the sound waves that are generated uh, during those various events. I did want to point out one thing, if we go to the very end of the movie, the propagation of droplets from your mouth, if you were to cough or sneeze, and you're thinking about things like uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or the, the, the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease, uh, you're interested in how that moves through the air, people use Schlieren photography with a high-speed camera, just like those folks did, to look at how well the mask works and which way the droplets go and so forth. All right, so waves are critical to you, the way in which you operate uh, most of the time, right? So you're using sound waves. Waves are also a big thing in art. Uh, this is one of the classics. This is uh, actually a wood cutting, I think, uh, by Hokusai. It's a, picture, uh, a wave, uh, painting, a wood, uh, call, uh, an engraving, I guess, called The Great Wave of Kanagawa. To me, this wave always has this impression of claws coming out. I guess most people see it that way. Uh, but you see also the sense of scale. And in some sense, uh, in, in some ways, the sense of uh, dominance that this uh, wave has, how, how large it is. And of course, you can see Mount Fuji way off in the distance there. We're going to come back to thinking about waves in greater detail uh, a little later in this class. But the main idea, so we've got propagating waves in a system, things like sound waves, water waves, they move at a certain speed. The main thing to realize with waves is they are giving you information about an event. So a wave certainly propagates at a certain speed, but it's carrying with it some information about an event that happened somewhere else. What I'm going to show you now is a movie of a nuclear explosion. This is Operation Hot Deck, and the specific uh, explosion is Nutmeg. This is, as you can see, from 1958. Uh, this is a movie um, reconstructed, actually, or um, I guess conserved by Livermore. Uh, so let me just run this. And you see the waves right there. The waves in the air moving up. You can see the, what's left of the blast back behind you. If you watch carefully, uh, there is an arrival at the beach itself. And by now the wave has gone way past you. You even see the shadow come through. Let me run that again. You notice the big bright flash in the beginning? That really bright domain is the time when all the interesting things happen. Everything else afterwards is signatures. Uh, the consequences of the event. The event was during the flash. Now all of these are the consequences. And you see that ring going around uh, the main mushroom cloud on the outside. Uh, the mushroom cloud itself is telling you something about the atmosphere, uh, the, the structure of the atmosphere. And then that ring going around is telling you something about the waves propagating in that atmosphere. Uh, this particular uh, weapon, I think, was actually at ground level, although some of these were uh, done in the air. But I think this was at ground level. Okay, so the point here is, if you were to look at that uh, wave coming by, you could have said something about the event itself. Or that wave was a shock wave. It's a little different from the traditional wave you think about with your sound wave in that the shock wave involves a very large change in a quantity that's coming at you. So maybe the pressure jumps when the shock wave uh, arrives. So this is the point I want to get across. A shock wave, which is the subject of most of our, our lecture here or the next couple of lectures, it's a wave that carries a sudden jump in whatever quantity you're interested in. So in the case of the blast that we just saw, the shock wave was carrying a jump in the pressure. That's also what you saw with the aircraft. The sound wave also has a change in the pressure, but that's a gentle change in the pressure. With the shock wave, you get a sudden change in the pressure. The suddenness of that jump is a really important thing. Okay, so we've got a wave and we've got a jump. These are the two characteristics we need. So the way we should think about this, we have an event, some kind of an extreme event that's going to occur. That event is going to send off information about the event. The information that's propagating out is a shock wave. It's a propagating jump in something. So here's another movie. 
this is of the impact of uh, skill here. At, I forget what this is, okay, three and a half kilometers per second. This is a movie made at Kumamoto University. It's impacting a block of a plastic, so a clear, transparent solid. Let's just watch. No sound in this one. I would have had to add my own sound to, for you to see it. Uh, this movie was taken using this particular camera that you see on the bottom left, a Shimazu camera. Uh, very nice camera up there. Uh, runs at fairly high uh, uh, framing rate, so that is the speed at which it takes the picture. I forget what it was in this case, um, probably something like 2 million frames per second. Uh, we can go look at the numbers to, to get a sense of it. Uh, but this thing is about 3 millimeters across. Let's watch it again. What you'll see is there's an impact that occurs at this point, then there's a wave that propagates out and you can watch the wave move through the solid. In this case, the wave is moving in the solid. It's not in the air around you, but in the solid itself. And then you will see that behind the point of impact, you get material that's thrown off as ejecta. Effectively, you're creating a crater inside this plate. So one thing to, to understand here, this is a plate that is edge on. So imagine I hold up a book and I'm hitting the edge of the book with this ball. So you see the wave there? There's the wave, it's propagated a certain distance. That moves up. Then you see the wave reflecting from the boundaries, comes back in. This region that's damaged in the middle here, uh, that, that's changing color, is because it's damaged. You see the ejector, things flowing out from the back. The wave keeps going, it reflects from the back surface, reflects again, comes through. And the rest of the time, you just see the waves move back and forth. The shock was only in that very early stage when I was about here. This is a shock wave now, where you see that big change in the color, in the gray scale, right? That's where you have this jump in the pressure, or in this case, the stress inside the solid. All right, so a shock wave is a propagating jump, moves at a certain speed. And what we want to understand is, um, what does this mean for uh, us in a particular system, whichever system we choose to look at. Uh, so um, this, I'm just showing you here three pictures from that one movie that we just saw. It's the same movie. I'm just picking out three pictures. And you'll see the time scales down here. This was a picture at set, taken at seven microseconds, at 10 microseconds, and 15 microseconds. So a microsecond is a millionth of a second. Uh, for those of you who don't think uh, all the time in terms of microseconds, uh, so you blink about 30 times a second, so you, one blink of yours is 30 milliseconds. Um, 30 milliseconds would be 30,000 microseconds. So you could take 30,000 pictures in the time you blink if you're taking pictures of this frame rate. Uh, and you can watch this, uh, this wave move through. So you're seeing something propagating. The question is what is propagating? Right? In this case, it's a jump in the stress in the solid. Uh, the stress in the solid is essentially a measure of the local force, the force density in the solid. This is just like you saw the shock waves around the uh, aircraft or the shock wave coming off the nuclear blast. This is a shock wave coming off an impact event, but it's still a propagating shock. All right, with that background, let's try to bring things together. So there are two parts to a shock that we want to think about. A jump and a shock speed. So there's a sudden jump here, and then there's a shock speed. So let's think about the jump part here. So here's a plot. Imagine I'm thinking about uh, the shock in the air or the shock in this uh, piece of material. Here's the pressure plotted as a function of time. Initially, it's whatever pressure I had before the shock wave arrives. At some time, so imagine I'm sitting in one place, and I'm measuring the pressure. So I stay in one place and I look at the pressure as the pressure comes by, as the shock waves come by, comes by. When the shock wave arrives, the pressure jumps to some higher level. This is the idea of the shock, that it is a jump. It's not increasing slowly, it jumps suddenly. It jumps over a very short time. It doesn't jump over zero time because the material has some constraints, but it will jump over a very, over a very short time and then it reaches some higher pressure after the shock. So 
if you were to look, for instance, on the right here, out here, this material is at a low pressure. Here, the pressure jumps, and here, the material is at a high pressure. Now, the difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right is kind of important. The picture on the right is what we think of as a snapshot. I take a picture with my camera, so at a given instant in time, I can see what's happening over all space. So this is the variation in space, the variation of the pressure with position at a fixed instant in time. Whereas the picture on the left is the opposite of that. So I'm sitting at a fixed position in space and seeing what happens with time. And I see this history of the pressure, okay? So this jump in the pressure is the important thing. There's a jump in a quantity that arrives. We're thinking of pressure right now, but later we might think about other things. We might think about, uh, for instance, um, the jump in the population of a particular colony, uh, the jump in the population of rabbits in Australia. Uh, we can look at a variety of different things like that. Okay, let's call the jump J for the moment. We'll come back to J later. On the other side, we know this thing is propagating. It's moving at a finite speed. We saw that a minute ago. The speed at which it moves is called the shock speed, S. So these two things are the important things to think about. We have an event, it generates a jump. The jump has some magnitude, J, and it's moving at some speed, S. Okay, those are the two ideas. Now, there's the, the propagating shock. We saw it a minute ago. So all, this is really all I want you to remember about a shock. The key idea is there's a jump and there's a wave. Those are the two critical ideas. And with that, we can then build an understanding of what's going to happen inside a structure. So first, what happens with the jump, right? Your jump is taking a system at some low pressure, some small force, and taking it to a large pressure, some large force. The question is whether the system, the material, can survive that large force. So often the jump can cause damage. So the shock when it arrives causes damage in your system. Something breaks, something fails. Now the jump propagates, so that's the wave part. It has a wave speed. What that wave is doing is moving the damage through your system. So your propagating jump is like propagating damage. You're beginning to create damage somewhere and then move that through the system. This is the critical piece of information. We have a jump and a wave, and they both relate to the damage that you're going to develop inside your system. Okay. There's another way of thinking about this that I think is kind of cool. And that is that you really should think about shocks as stitching together the space and time variables. So you're used to thinking about things in space. You're used to thinking about things changing with time. A shock forces you to tie those two together. They're tied together in a particular way by the shock speed. Let's just run through how that works. So there's a shock event itself. And the reason we think about that side of it, this is the jump that comes in, is to remember that every system you think about, uh, let's say you think about the, the air in the room, uh, or you're thinking about um, the, the um, uh, availability of food in your system, uh, in, your, in your particular urban system, um, or you're thinking about the, um, let's say the density of a particular chemical in the air in a chemical weapons problem, all right? Every system will respond to an applied force in some way. So if I try to change something in the system by applying a force, the system will respond. This idea is basically every force gives you a response. There's a connection, right? The particular response you get is what tells you what the system is like. So if I think in physical terms, if I have a piece of rubber, I squeeze it, I push on it, that's my force. It changes size by a certain amount, that's the response. But if it changes size a great deal, we say it's a soft rubber. If it changes size, size only a little bit, we say it's a stiff rubber, right? This is the deformation of the rubber. So this characterizes the system. So if you look at a force response curve, that tells you something about the system and what it's made of. The question we ask is what happens when that system, which has a certain response, right? When it perceives a jump. So it's, the system is used to responding in a certain way, and now suddenly a jump arrives in my applied force. Instead of applying the force slowly, the force is applied fast. What will the system do? That's the first question. 
The second question though, is it turns out that almost any system that we are interested in, anything that you're used to working with as humans, right? It has some length scale and some time scale. That is, um, if I'm thinking about the room, the room has some size. Um, if I'm thinking about my desk, the desk has a certain size. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a particular time scale associated with my desk too, because the desk has certain stiffness that gives me a certain sound speed in the desk. Um, so I have a characteristic length scale and a characteristic time scale whenever I talk about a system. If I think about my, my head and the, my brain inside it, there's a certain size to it, and the brain has a certain stiffness, so that means there's a characteristic time associated with waves moving in the brain. Now let's think about the length scale part of that. So if I have something with a certain size, let's say I've got the moon, it's got a certain size. Once you give me the size, if I know the speed of a shock, I can take the size of the body divided by the speed of the shock, and I will get a time scale. That time scale is the time it takes for the shock to move across the body. I'm going to call that time scale tau. Now my system has its own response time. So the system likes to operate in a certain uh, time scale. The shock forces it to have a different time scale. The question is what happens when the system perceives the shock? So let me go back to the two parts of the shock, right? There's a jump and there's a speed. The jump tells me, well, the jump relates to how the system can respond to a very high force applied suddenly. The speed tells me how the system response time relates to the, the time scale for the shock. And the time scale for the shock is determined by the spacing of uh, the characteristic lengths inside your system. So for instance, the, 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 the uh, uh, let's say the, um, if you think about the moon, the thickness of the crust of the moon as compared to the core of the moon, that kind of structure. All right. I have, actually have a picture here that is uh, kind of an interesting one up on top. This is a, a, a calculation of what happens inside a material that contains particles inside it. There's a particle here, and there's another particle there, and one there, when a shock wave comes through. And you can see some regions are red and some regions are blue. The red regions are regions that are seeing very high forces, very high stresses, and are likely to fail. Okay, so these propagating jumps, which we call shocks, can have major impacts when they interact with the system. So let's look at some examples. I'm going to spend the next few minutes with some pretty pictures. All right. So first, a speeding bullet. So I've got a bullet moving at Mach 1.1. Uh, the way you define this Mach number is to take the speed of the bullet and divide it by the speed of sound in the particular, in the air at this point. So the speed of sound in air is, uh, I don't know, 330 meters per second, something like that. Uh, if you're moving faster than the speed of sound, then you, you look at a number bigger than one. Um, the picture on the left, by the way, these are the same bullet, the same time, okay, pictures taken using two different techniques. The picture on the left is a shadow graph. So the shadow graph shows you where the density is changing dramatically, and you see that line up on the top here, this, this line. This is a shock. It's a kind of shock called a bow shock. Like, think of the bow of a, a boat, right, in front of that. Uh, the picture on the right is with a different technique called Schlieren photography. It's what you saw in the, in the video from uh, NPR, and you see much more structure here. Um, many more things happening, but you can see more clearly with Schlieren including these little rings back here, these little things like vortices going away uh, from the bullet. So you see lots of things happening during this event. If I were able to measure these shocks, I could say a good, good deal about the bullet. When that bullet hits a target, in this case, a thin sheet of metal, this is what happens. So the bullet impacts it, goes right through, leaves pieces behind. Some of these pieces are flying off. Here's the bullet itself. There are the shock waves coming across. By the way, you can look at the angle of these shock waves and say something about speed. Uh, you see back here, there are other waves moving through the air. These relate to the failure process here, what's happening inside this metal. So it has an extreme event and you can see the shocks coming off. Here's shocks coming off a supersonic uh, aircraft. So if you saw a picture like this before in color, this is just a very old picture. 
You can see this also at much larger scales. This is a Hubble telescope photograph uh, of a bow shot around the star in Orion, uh, which is a constellation that I'm hoping that all of you have seen. Uh, but here, you can see the bow shot right here. This is at a very large scale. This is going to be light years in distance. It's a very, very large shot, but it's visible from, from Earth. And as we showed you a little while ago, you can also see it from thermonuclear weapons. So this is a thermonuclear weapon, it's like a hydrogen bomb. Uh, this is a picture taken from, let's see, 80 kilometers away. Uh, this is from 1958 or so, maybe 1952, 52, I think. Um, and you can see here's the actual rising plume because things have gotten very hot. But here's the signature in the air, the shocks moving through. All right, so we can get all of these events that, that generate shocks. You can even see it. Astronomers studied V906 Carini using high energy data from Fermi, NASA's New Star X ray telescope, and invisible light from a Canadian satellite named Bright Toronto. Shaped by the orbital motion of the stars, the explosion debris first forms a thick expanding ring around the system. Then, after 10 days or so, vast outflows, likely driven by residual fusion on the white dwarf, strike the ring. The resulting shock waves produce gamma ray and optical flares that radiate away most of the Nova's energy. These observations provide the first direct evidence that shock waves can power most of a stellar explosion's visible light. Figuring out how they work in nearby Novi will help us understand more powerful events much deeper in the cosmos. Okay, so we see them at very large scales, right? The bullet is something smaller than your finger. You saw shocks there, you see it all the way up to those massive stellar explosions. All right, so we know there are shocks, we see them, they're propagating jumps. Let's talk for a minute about what causes a shock. So there are two kinds of things that cause shocks, either an extreme event or an instability. Um, I think all of you have an idea of what an extreme event is. So here's a picture from ready.gov, which is how you would get ready for a nuclear holocaust, I suppose, um, of, a, of a nuclear blast. On the right is, an instability. Uh, this is actually a movie from, I'm not sure what to pronounce this, O.T. Saponin from uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, Petro Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, what we're looking at here is the collapse of a bubble. So this is four millimeters in diameter right now. It's a bubble inside a fluid and it's collapsing. Let's just watch. So now we're going to a higher framing rate so you can see what's happening. And there goes the shockwave. And if you look just before the collapse, the temperature gets really hot. Let me, let me run that once more. Because one of the things you want to see here is you start with this thing that's nearly spherical, right? It's a bubble, should be round. And then as it collapses, it is no longer spherical. And eventually, what actually happens inside that is you, you form a jet, which is part of what results in this shock. What you have here is an example of something that's an instability. So it was deforming in one way, it begins to deform in another way. And once that change happens, you see the shock. So it is that change, that transition, that causes the shock itself. OK. Um, I want to get these two ideas in place, because they, they relate to the everyday experience that we have. But I'm, I'm trying, going to try to give you a big picture view of this. So extreme events versus instabilities, two different kinds of things. So an extreme event is something like this explosion. This, by the way, is not a nuclear weapon, even though it looks like one. This is actually a tank filled with a chemical that explodes. Uh, and this is somewhere in Canada. Um, and you can see you get the same kind of rise. Well, that's to do with heat and the way the atmosphere is. Um, but here's the main point. And when you think of an extreme event, you tend to think of a blast of some sort or an impact or uh, a bullet or a, a mine explosion. You tend to think there's an external actor, somebody decided to do something, that it appears in the system at some time. And what's happening in that extreme event is you're going to put a lot of energy into a small space and you put it in a short time. That gives you a high energy density. So the energy in that domain suddenly became very high. 
and you did it in a short time, so you get a transient. The high energy density gives you the jump, the transient gives you the wave. So the jump and the wave, right, which represent a shock. So those two come from an extreme event because you've got the energy density and things are happening in a short time. And instability is a different problem. So this is a balloon bursting. Let me run that again. So if you think about it, let's say you start blowing up a balloon, right? The balloon is just a thin uh, piece of plastic. As you blow it up, the balloon increases in volume. What happens is the plastic gets, the, the, the skin of the balloon gets thinner and thinner. So that you can actually calculate what the thickness of the skin would be. You get only one answer. That's the thickness of the skin. As you keep blowing though, you reach some point at which the balloon becomes unstable. And what that really means is if you try to calculate the thickness of the skin of the balloon, at some size of the balloon, parts of the balloon become much thinner than other parts. And then those parts that are very thin are the parts that break. And when they break, the rest of the balloon begins to fail and you see a shock wave actually propagating around the balloon. Let me run that again. You see that wave propagating through? And that's how the balloon fails. So what happened here was you had something that was initially stable, meaning you could keep blowing up the balloon and it would just grow in size. And then it became unstable. You couldn't blow it up any further. So you start with something that's a stable process that is growing slowly. Usually in that kind of a stable process, your energy is stored in your system and it's relatively uniformly distributed. At some critical time, critical condition, the process becomes unstable. What that means is you can no longer continue the process in the, the way you used to before. Instead, what you end up getting in these instabilities, mathematically, is the monster saying you have two answers to the problem. One answer where you have a thin sheet everywhere, and another answer where you have thin sheets somewhere, thick sheets somewhere else. So you get this transition to multiple states, multiple thicknesses. And that's the collapse process. That's how the balloon fails. The point is, when you develop this instability, when the system begins to fail, your energy gets localized. Something gets localized, typically the energy localizes. The information about the localization propagates. Localized meaning it's not spread out everywhere, it's concentrated in one area, which means you get a high energy density. That gives you a jump and the propagation gives you a wave. So although you've got different backgrounds to how these things develop, the end result is this jump in the wave in both cases. Okay? But one tends to think about these differently. You think of the external actor problem, the extreme event as being a sudden event. This is something that happens slowly. Okay. I'm going to show you some examples of extreme events here to try to bring things together. This is a supernova. This is the Crab Nebula. Um, picture taken with Hubble, and you can see what's left. Here's Tycho Crater on the moon. I pointed that out at the very beginning of the session. Here's the nuclear explosion we've been looking at for a while. The Kobe earthquake in Japan. And at some point I want to talk about uh, how this earthquake was sensed. An explosion, let's say, on a battlefield. Uh, and you can see people get subject to waves in such events. And of course, things like a car crash. So all of these are extreme events. In each case, you get a high energy density, you're going to get a propagating shock, and that shock does some damage. That damage is either visible to the very long term, tens of millions of years, or is visible immediately in terms of injury. You can see more things that you might be not as familiar with. So if you were to try to protect a spacecraft, you'll get a, a cratering in the spacecraft and the development of something called spall, it's how we actually protect spacecraft. This is a laser interacting with matter. You get something that looks very much like a crater, high power laser going onto the material. You break up kidney stones. So here's a stone in, in the kidney. Oops, there's, there's, one. Oops. there's a stone. You generate a shock wave, focus it on the stone. You can break it up. It's the same mechanism. We can talk through that. We showed you this movie a little while ago. As you get older, when you're likely to fall, your sensitivity to fall is, control, is affected by shocks inside your system. And of course, things like concussions and uh, uh, impact in sports. So all of these relate to the same problem. These are extreme events. They generate those kinds of signatures. 
and they're interested in how the signature affects the behavior. On the other hand, instabilities are things like this. So this picture on the left is a piece of concrete that's being very slowly compressed. It's deforming normally, so it's, so it's being compressed in the vertical direction. And at some point as you load it up, it suddenly fails. So something that was initially stable is now unstable. And you get these fractures, these fragments that fly away. This is also an instability, right? So this is a tsunami. This is the, the, the one in Japan uh, from about 10 years ago. Uh, so it was caused by an earthquake. The earthquake itself can be viewed as an instability. You are storing energy for a long time, and then suddenly it slips. That generates things like the tsunami. You see the same instabilities in explosives. So this is a picture from Dana Dlot uh, in Illinois. Uh, what he's looking at is hot spots inside an explosive. If you try to carry a piece of explosive around, inside it you can get a region that's suddenly hot because of unstable instab uh, instability in the deformation, and then that's what might cause it to explode. And finally, to make a link for you, here's another kind of instability. This is the size of the population as a function of time. And these two lines here are kind of important. This first line here is how much you can sustain in the population when the environment is dry. So uh, you have a dry season. And this is how much you can sustain when the environment is wet. You have a wet season. Now imagine that when the environment is wet, your population grows rapidly and then suddenly the environment becomes dry, right? So can you sustain the population or will you collapse? So you no longer have the food to eat. How does the system collapse? There's a whole interesting area about what defines a shock and what defines a collapse inside social structures. A really interesting area where uh, I think the social scientists and the mathematicians think very differently. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple of uh, classes. All right, and finally, which systems produce shocks? So in general, if you look at the force as a function of the response, if you move along the red line versus the green line, the red line will cause a shock. So if things stiffen, the more you push. The harder you push, the more it resists you, that kind of a system develops a shock. All right, so stiffening systems are the ones that shock. And that tells you, if you want to design a system that will survive, you often want to go with a softening system. Um, and these are just examples. You'll see them in fluids and in polymers and so forth, different kinds of response functions. All right. And you're going to see these in impacts. Uh, I don't have time to really run through these. I'm realizing I'm running slow here. Uh, but this is impact onto a single fiber. Uh, you can see how the fiber stretches out. Uh, you can get impact onto plates. In all of these cases, we're generating shocks. And all of those cases, we're interested in the failure process. All right, so I'm going to wrap up here. So next time, we're going to focus, think really about what happens because of a shock. Now that we know what a shock is, we're going to focus on what happens because of a shock. So let me summarize some basic things. Shocks are typically caused by an extreme event or an instability. You characterize them by a jump that propagates. How big the jump is determines how much damage you've got. How fast it propagates determines how you'll communicate information about whatever event caused the shock. And some systems will tend to develop shocks, while other systems will tend to disperse them, to suppress them. So that's the core of what I want to talk about, get the main idea across about a shock wave, and then we look at its applications over the next three classes. Thank you all. <laughs>